Hello, and welcome to the Wealth and Wisdom Show. I'm James DeGiorgia. On today's show, we'll be discussing what's being called the biggest financial scandal in the history of Wall Street, the $50 billion Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme. With us today is Stephen Katzman. Mr. Katzman graduated from the University of Florida and the University of Florida Law School with high honors. He has over 25 years of experience in complex business and commercial litigation, including extensive securities litigation work. AV rated by Martindale Hubble, the highest rating by the most respected peer rating legal service. Elected to the Florida Super Lawyers, recognizing top 5% in their field for each year the rating service has existed. And then also today we have joining with us is Richard S. Lehman. Mr. Lehman is a graduate of Georgetown Law School and obtained his master's degree in taxation from New York University. Mr. Lehman served as a law clerk to the United States Tax Court and a senior attorney in the Chief Counsel's Office for the Eternal Revenue Service. Mr. Lehman has been practicing in South Florida for more than 30 years. His tax practice has covered an extremely wide array of international and domestic clients, perfect for the subject matter. Welcome to the show. So I, I, I guess where we start off is, you know, what exactly, we keep hearing Ponzi scheme over and over again. What exactly is a Ponzi scheme and, and, um, and uh, where, you know, where was it for, first coined? A Ponzi scheme is basically any time someone takes money from new investors and uses that to pay the old investors instead of the profits from an investment. Uh, the phrase was coined after Charles Ponzi in 1903, who had come over to this country and became a multimillionaire almost overnight, only for people to find out later that instead of him making the promised profits off of his investments, he was just taking money from new investors to give to the old ones. Sooner or later, that tends to catch up with people, either because You've now promised more money than you're able to bring in new investors or because there may be some change in the economic circumstances where all of a sudden people want to pull their money out and you don't have the money to do it. Now, every Ponzi scheme seems to have certain common denominators and we see it over and over again. First, we find that there's a absolute quality list of investors. And very often, the way that the promoter is successful is not selling themselves or in their investment returns as much as the good company in which you're going to keep. Second, anybody who complains or raises a question is immediately offered all their money back. Only typically to say, well, if you're that anxious to give me my money back, I, I should probably keep it with you. The takeaway. Yeah, absolutely. So very often when we talk about Ponzi schemes, you'll hear people refer to it as, well, isn't that like paying, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul? And in some ways it is, but really what happens is we're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, and now we got to go find Phil so we can pay Peter. And exactly, this is why this is such an important story here in South Florida in that he used the relationships that he garnered at the Boca, uh, at the with Palm Beach uh, Social Clubs, and was it Boca Rio Country Club, in order to pull a lot of people in. So, uh, so and so's investing with him. He got another guy to invest, and it, it's, it, it turned out to a situation where we may have literally hundreds of people in the Boca Raton Palm Beach area that have been taken in by this. Unfortunately, not only is that true, but we're talking not just individuals, not just families, but charitable foundations, this scandal has very far-reaching effects on our community. Charities and, and, uh, and social funds. So what do you do if, you, if you're watching this unfold right now? We're right in the middle of this. It's at the very beginning. You know, what do you do if you've been caught up with this Ponzi scheme? Well, the interesting thing is that the advice I'm going to give is don't rush to do anything immediately. This is a very fluid situation. There are a lot of moving parts at the same time that can affect one another. And one of the things that Rick and I want to make sure that your viewers understand as we go through these discussions is that if you rush to a decision today, you may actually limit your opportunities later. There's really only one thing that people need to immediately do and that is to gather as much of their records as they can to show the hard dollars 
that they've actually put into this and to try and trace those dollars in and out of the Madoff brokerage firm so that whatever professionals they work with, they'll have the records to establish their claim. And, and so this, well, one of the things that was very unusual about this is the record keeping was really superb in terms of what was presented to investors. So the very first thing you, you suggest is to go back and get every piece of paperwork that they've ever received or that any checks they had written, any updates they had occurred, any piece of paper whatsoever and get it in one place, copy it, make <laughs> triplicate copies. Absolutely. Okay. Not only that, but tax returns as well, because all of that's going to be very important to the professionals that help at least mitigate some of the devastating losses that have occurred. And, and you make a very important point, which is part of the way you get away with something like this is you send professional statements every month, trade confirmations every trade, so that your investor has no reason to doubt the veracity of what they're receiving. It all looks normal. They're reporting it on their tax returns. They're paying taxes on the gains. They have no reason to doubt that what they are seeing is real until the house of cards collapses. And the complexity of it is represented by how many years this has been going on. It's more than nine years that this whole thing was real, this maintained this Ponzi scheme. We have had clients come to us who have been investing with Bernie Madoff or firms of his since the 1970s. It goes longer and deeper than even the press reports have indicated. But it's really shocking if it goes back even, even before the turn of, the, of, of this last decade. So tell me, you know, if you're in a situation where you, you're going ahead and you're collecting your your paperwork and, you, and you're getting yourself together you know, for presentation, most viewers that are caught in this are going to be wondering, you know, how do I value my claim? You know, am I going to get any money? You know, where do I go? Uh, the questions are so, so numerous. Well, um, that really is the key question. How do you value the claim? What is the loss here? And unfortunately, I have to give you a lawyer's answer. Mm -hmm. It depends. It depends upon the purpose for the declaration of the loss. Because if you're operating under one set of laws for, let's say, a litigation purpose or securities laws, you may value the claim one way. If you're making a claim against SIPC for some insurance proceeds, you may be able to value it a different way. Now, what is SIPC? It's very interesting you raise that because everybody's been reading about it. It's basically an insurance company that ensures not trading losses or fraud losses, which the litigation and the receivership proceedings are all geared at, but rather it protects against the insolvency of a brokerage firm and really protects against theft. And one of the key issues is going to be for each investor, how much of their loss was trading losses and how much of it was someone just stole their money and absconded with it. For trading losses, one may find that their actual recoverable loss is based upon what's called an out-of-pocket formula, which means actual dollars that they paid over minus any money they got back. Net that out. So let's take a typical investor who's been in this for 10 years, invested $500,000. Every year he took out $50,000 in income. Well, by the time he's done, He's got an account statement that says his account is worth two and a half million dollars. He thinks he's doing well and he's making lifestyle decisions based upon that. When in reality, his recoverable loss may be far less than that. Mm -hmm. Similarly, and this is something I'm going to ask Rick to address in a couple of minutes, for tax purposes, is it a theft loss? How do you value that? Is it a matter of you paid income taxes on income that never existed, what people call phantom income? So how are you going to measure your loss there? And one of the other interesting things that happens, and is very unfortunate, is a lot of claimants who are victims are thinking about, well, how do I measure my loss and how much can I recover? When one of the serious risks that exist for them is they could become defendants. If they received any money back within the last six years, under various state or federal laws, they may find that a receiver or bankruptcy trustee is demanding that they return that money to the pot to then get split up and divided amongst everybody.